this edition of Fireside Tech Talks with Blaze. I'm Blaze Stewart, architect at Winelect, and today we're going to be looking at what's new on Azure and then taking a look at some recent responses from former Microsoft leadership on the open source movement and how Microsoft has embraced that movement. First, let's start off with what's new on Microsoft. So a couple of announcements that were made this week, I think are relevant. There's a lot of announcements that were made about things going into preview, but to hit a couple of things about things that I think were pretty significant this week was one, a collaboration between Docker and Azure, where Docker will now have built into the Docker CLI, the ability to use Azure container instances for Docker context. So you can set up a Docker context using the Azure CLI, log on to Azure, and then spin up containers on Azure Container Instances without having to have a dedicated Docker environment. So it's some interesting collaboration going on with Microsoft and Azure in that respect. So this will allow you to quickly spin up and spin down containers without having to have a full-blown development environment to do that. Another interesting development in the Microsoft space is the ability to have Azure Image Builder. And this was the ability to create custom VM images that meet security compliance requirements uh, for faster development for the enterprise. Now, previously, building images on uh, Azure typically required that you do that offline in some kind of local dev environment, then take that existing image and push it up to Azure, or you had to go with some option of using like a marketplace image and then using some kind of custom script to automate the build of that image with your custom software. But now with this tool, you can include apps and things on some base images and then put those out into image galleries for consumption by your organization. Another announcement related to monitoring comes from Azure Advisor. Now, Azure Advisor on Azure is a free service that gives you best practice type recommendations for your Azure resources, such as security and figuring out how to optimize costs on Azure. Uh, the Azure Advisor now has the digest view where it allows you to configure to receive periodic summaries of all the things that are being recommended by Azure Advisor versus something that is what has currently been the current state of the product where you would go into the portal and you would see a myriad of different advices that it was offering through the portal. And to go through all of that can sometimes be rather arduous for a rather large deployment. However, the digest view will post new updates and give you a condensed version of what it is recommending now inside of Azure Advisor. Another announcement came out related to ultra storage disk now Ultra storage disk is the top tier disk available from Azure for disk on Azure. And these have been available to a few new regions, including the central US, West US, central, South Central US, uh, US Gov, Virginia, France, Central, Japan East, and so on. The ultra disk offer higher IOPS and they offer much higher throughput for the given amount of workloads that are put on these. And these named data centers are some of the more legacy data centers that Microsoft has had, such as Central U.S. and West U.S., the South Central U.S., and the U.S. Gov and uh, Virginia. Uh, so most of the new data centers have gotten these sooner, but the older, more uh, legacy ones are now getting these as well. So these will offer VMs better performance when it comes to disk operations and different kinds of throughput to those disks as well. Another announcement coming from Backup. Now Backup allows you to have backups that will prevent you from doing accidental deletions of files by Azure uh, and other sources that will be handled through Backup. So you can have multiple layers of security built in and Backup being one of those for the kind of file services that are offered through Azure file shares through Azure storage accounts. Now that announcements are out of the way, let's shift to our main story and talk about some of the former leadership's responses to Microsoft's pivot to open source. I've already done a few stories on this covering uh, the Microsoft's opening up to open source. And I talked last week about some of the key takeaways from build from last week about how Microsoft made a number of announcements that were really encouraging uh, doubling down on their commitment to open source. Everybody knows that Microsoft has not always been friendly to open source and under the prior leadership with Microsoft, it was almost antagonistic towards open source. And I wanted to look at some of these 
former views and how they have come full circle and have changed their opinions about open source, looking at a couple of the former leaders in the Microsoft space. The first individual I want to talk about is Steve Sanofsky. Now, Sanofsky was the former VP of the Windows division at Microsoft, and he was one of the main proprietors behind the success of Windows 7, but he had a rather abrupt departure from Microsoft in 2012, and it was a mutual departure, according to most sources. Uh, the internal politics of whatever was going on at that time was very tumultuous at Microsoft. Uh, we did an analysis of some of that when we looked at Silverlight, and and the grander scope of what was going on at Microsoft was trying to figure out the vision for the future of Windows and the Office products. And there was a lot of churn within the context of Microsoft about what was going to drive Microsoft in the future. Was it going to be Windows? Was it going to be uh, something else? And ultimately what won out was the Microsoft software as a service and platform as a service offering such as Office 365 and Microsoft Azure. However, that's not the case in the early 2010s whenever Microsoft was still trying to figure out how to do mobile and still trying to figure out what the future of Windows was in the given the rise of things like the iPhone and Android and a number of other things that were emerging in tech at that time. Steve Sunoski, in a recent interview that he did with ZDNet, he made some commentary on this, and he talks about how Microsoft used to be the agency that would embrace, extend, and then extinguish products that were emerging in technology in order to suppress a lot of innovation that was going on in there so they could maintain a position of dominance in that, and so they could have cycles of things going on. However, in recent years, Microsoft has obviously shifted away from that, and Sinovsky uh, went on Twitter and made a number of posts that were in light of this kind of model that Microsoft used to do, where it, it had the ability to exert its hegemony really over the IT industry and be able to purchase things, extend and embrace them. And then after a while, it would sunset a project and redo something in order to create some of these cycles that were going on for uh, new and improved products that were coming out. Sinovsky in those tweets talks about the rise of software as a service where he says, and I quote, what really happened starting in 1999-2000 was SaaS or software as a service. While there was some of that with Windows with ASP or hosted, the problem was simply that Linux worked better. Alternatively, Windows wasn't really set up to be licensed in this way outside of a company. What Sanofsky was getting at with those tweets was how Linux was better positioned to service things like self-hosted websites where a person could go out and create a website on a web host and that website could be accessed by any number of users and there was no licensing cost for that. Linux was very well positioned to do that because it allowed these companies that didn't have Windows licensing and didn't have the funds to pay for Windows licensing simply need to purchase a hardware platform platform and then install some Linux software on it. And then they could provide a LAMP stack for people that wanted to pay a monthly subscription for that. And so you had the ability to host something like a simple WordPress site or back in the early 2000s, something like PHP Nuke. Uh, and you could host that website for you know 10 or 15 bucks a month. With Windows, that was a little bit harder to do because Windows had a per user licensing agreement and then they also charged for the number of cores for things like the databases. And the licensing model just was not conducive for companies that wanted to set up platforms that were serving thousands and thousands of potential users through a website. Microsoft Windows was set up more for the enterprise and it was intended for that. So it wasn't very conducive for software as a service offering. So people were turning to Linux in order to meet those demands that were arising around that time. With that interview with ZDNet, he does mention the model that Linux follows being open source and how nobody particularly owns Linux. There is no single proprietor of that software, so there are multiple contributors to it, including many companies that are in competition with one another, such as Google, Microsoft, uh, IBM and whoever it might be. But in all of this, the Linux ecosystem is not going to be something that is going to be dominated by Windows. But now that things have moved to the cloud and things have gotten away from this more on-premise model and the enterprise licensing model that Microsoft was traditionally known for, more and more people are turning to Linux and it has now become the preferred operating system on Microsoft Azure. 
something around 60% of the VMs running on Azure use Linux instead of Windows. And so Microsoft has really done a good job at pivoting towards this more open platform, and they are actually making large numbers of contributions to Linux because of that. The next individual I want to look at is Steve Ballmer. Now, Steve Ballmer is known for making a lot of very strong statements, and some of them might be even considered gaffes. And he was a cult of personality or somewhat of a cult of personality for some of the oddities that he did while he was at Microsoft. And he really drove a hard ship while he was there, really driving the developer platforms as well as the product offerings towards a specific goal that was his vision for the company. And it was one of those things that was very focused in on the Microsoft ecosystem without really considering much beyond that. So there was a lot of very Microsoft-centric driving vision from Balmer. And and this was one of the reasons that he might have been selected as the successor to Bill Gates, because in many ways he shared that same opinion with Bill Gates. Steve Ballmer famously called Linux a cancer, where he said Linux is a cancer that attaches itself in an intellectual property sense to everything it touches. Steve Ballmer was getting at how Linux was a fast follower in many respects behind a lot of the kind of innovations that were coming out in terms of technology. So Linux would often take an idea that had been previously developed by a proprietary software model and then would make an open source implementation of that model. And he calls this kind of fast following an intellectual property a cancer that was attached to whatever that intellectual property that was being developed by whoever that proprietor was. Of course, there has been a pivot away from this, even by Steve Ballmer in recent years, where he has said some rather praiseworthy things of Linux, where he says he, in fact, loves Linux. Software innovation in terms of intellectual property nowadays is typically a collaborative effort by multiple different competing organizations. And it would seem odd that competing organizations would actually converge around a particular idea to propel that idea forward. But given that most large IT companies have pivoted towards software as a service, what they're attempting to do is figure out how they can take an idea such as Kubernetes, for instance, and make Kubernetes available on their particular platform as a service offering or software as a service offering and do it better than the other companies such as Microsoft doing Azure Kubernetes service against Google's uh, Kubernetes experience or Amazon's Kubernetes experience. And they're trying to outdo one another by increasing the ability to. The third individual I want to talk about is Brad Smith, who is the chief general counsel at Microsoft. And I've quoted Brad Smith before in the piece that I did on AWS, Microsoft and the Jedi contract, where Brad Smith had some things to say about how Microsoft won the contract over AWS. And Brad Smith said in a recent interview concerning Microsoft at MIT concerning open source, he says, Microsoft was on the wrong side of history when open source exploded at the beginning of the century, and I could say that about me personally. Today, Microsoft is the single largest contributor to open source project in the world when it comes to businesses. When we look at GitHub, we see it as a home for open source development, and we see our responsibility as the stewards to make it secure, productive, home for developers. So what Brad Smith is getting at here is Microsoft Fiber previously being more antagonistic towards open source. And we've seen that with some of the comments that were made by Steve Sinofsky and Steve Ballmer. And Brad Smith says that Microsoft was on the wrong side of history there. And rather they were uh, pivoting away from that. And, and Brad Smith goes on to say that it's a good thing because people can change a person can change their opinions about things. And Microsoft certainly has done that under the uh, new regiment under Sacha Nadella. And the open source initiatives that Microsoft has nowadays are too many to na name. And uh, many of the cool projects that are coming out of Microsoft are open source already. But even so, Microsoft has made a number of headways in its commitment to open source, particularly around GitHub. And uh, GitHub being one of the main places that open source software is hosted. And and it has tried to enhance the 
the developer experience on GitHub by adding a number of features that are there for folks to use, uh, such as GitHub Actions, and they've had private repos and a number of other things on GitHub that are really nice features that enable developers such as myself and others to take advantage of those and be able to have an open place where they can share their open source software in a uh, secure fashion. The last individual I want to talk about uh, is none other than the founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates, along with Paul Allen. But Bill Gates went on record as saying some rather damning things about the GPL uh, model. And he says of the GPL, he says the problem for commercial software users relative to GNU and GPL licenses, and we're just making sure that people understand it, is that it is impossible for a commercial company to use any of the work or build on it at work. There are people who believe that commercial software should not exist at all, and they should not be no jobs or taxes around commercial software at all. And then he goes on to say is that the GPL was created with the goals in mind and so that the people should should understand the GPL. When people say open source, they often mean GPL. And what he was talking about was how the licensing of GPL works, which basically says that anybody can use any software that is uh, available under the GPU license. And the, the, the stipulations under the GPL license is implies that any kind of extensions you make to that have to be shared publicly and they have to be republished along with the, the rest of the source code that were made in the GPL license. And so what Bill Gates is getting at here, he's saying that unless that it's impossible for a commercial software company to abide with this license under the stipulation that they have to share their code with the world. And this is coming in a time when the open source community principally used the GPL license as a way to ensure that something would remain open source and prevent commercial companies from snatching it up and then extending it without sharing that back to the community. And the GPL license is intended to keep open source open. And the conflict that commercial software company might have with that is that they could not keep their software secret and therefore couldn't make money on that. However, in the GPL license, this has not so much been a problem in recent years because more and more software companies are no longer selling software licensing as a way to make money. Rather, they're selling software as a service. And the GPL license does allow for that kind of service offering so where you can take an open source project and use it as a, sell it as a service. You can sell it on your servers and give people access to it. And then you can charge money to access that server uh, or the service that is provided by that open source software. And so as long as your com any changes you make to that software are being given back to the community, you can use it for the service models that are being used by many of the companies that exist out there. And to this end, many of the companies like Microsoft and Google and others that would otherwise use proprietary software can now take advantage of the GPL uh, and they can take advantage of the software that is written in the GPL model. However, there are a number of other software licenses out there that are available. And one of the ones that is principally used by Microsoft is the MIT model or the MIT license, which is a very uh, prom a promiscuous license. I might say that and it's a very open model that allows you to take any software license under that. And as long as you maintain the license and the copyright notice, you can pretty much use it for whatever you want to. And it's also this, this sways people from uh, suing somebody over the use of that software too, because there are stipulations in the license that say it's provided as is and many of other things, but the different licensing and open source can have different implications on business models. Uh, but even so in recent years, because Microsoft has pivoted more towards the, as a service model on pretty much everything they do, the, the conflict between proprietary software and open source no longer exists. And Gates has had many initiatives in recent years that do use open source software. And he himself even takes advantage of it somewhat. He, the, the, with the failure of the Windows phone, Bill Gates, he says that he uses an Android device with a lot of Microsoft software on it. But even so, the, the point being is that the new world where software is now more or less free in most contexts and you can download it, use it for uh, free on most systems and not to pay for it or sell that as a service eliminates this kind of conflict that Bill Gates was talking about in relationship to the kind of model that Microsoft employed in the past.
So what are the takeaways from this? There are two principal takeaways that I think that we can talk about when, in response to some of the change of hearts that many of the former or current Microsoft leadership has had towards open source. One is that open source can work for many companies, even commercial software companies like Microsoft. And what we have seen in the recent years, of course, is Microsoft's pivot towards open source and how software licensing as a model is more or less a dead model. But however, what one can do now is talk about how one can sell software as a service or provide a service model around software that makes the use of that open source software uh, more palatable. And that's really what many companies like Google, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, and a myriad of others are really driving for nowadays is not so much trying to sell you software, but sell you kind of services that come along with that software. And the model that even iOS and macOS use is that the macOS and iOS just are a way to allow my Apple to sell you a piece of hardware and the Linux operating system and the other operating other kind of open source projects that are out there are a way for Microsoft to sell you a platform or software as a service offering on Azure or Office 365. And the second takeaway that I think that is more a personal takeaway is that we can all change our opinions. And with Sanofsky, Steve Ballmer, Bill Gates, and Brad Smith, uh, we have seen how they have all kind of come full circle and have adjusted their personal opinions concerning uh, open source software one at one time or another they may have been diametrically opposed to the idea of open source software so the fact that even people that are at the leadership of big tech companies like Microsoft can change personal opinions shows that we can all kind of do it. And the implications of that abound certainly for uh, those who are more resistant to even something like a company like Microsoft, less such as myself, uh, being someone that came out of the more open source world into the Microsoft space. I was somebody that was pretty resistant to Microsoft after the Silverlight fiasco and was pretty much diametrically opposed to all things Microsoft, but had a change of heart when Microsoft kind of opened up to open source and I have become almost a big fanboy of Microsoft now because of that. Thanks for listening to this episode of Fireside Tech Talks with Blaze. Um, we'll be looking at probably a tech autopsy next week, and we'll probably be doing that on Windows Phone as we look at what caused the Windows Phone to get some market share and then just ultimately uh, putter out to where it was not much of an offering at all. And we'll look at the internal workings at Microsoft, which a part of it is an extension of this ongoing conversation around Microsoft's change of heart from the more proprietary closed model to an open source model.